Not a long time ago, in Russia, appeared such tendency to bang singers from performing because of the inappropriate themes that these artists sing about. Husky, Kravostok, Icepeak and many others have troubles with performing openly. Doesn't it remind you of something? Toasty! So, how about looking back into the history of the most oppressed and persecuted kind of music in USSR? The rock music. Hello, post-Russian. Most likely everything that you know about the Soviet music are things like, well, performance restrictions, repressions, and maybe something about the Kino band. And if you are from the post-Soviet countries, you probably only recognize the songs that your father used to play when he was drunk. And who do I try to fool? The percentage of single-parent families in Russia has raised to 30%, and almost always child is left with his mother, so you have no father. But we should not let such inconveniences make us sad, isn't it? The history of Soviet rock culture is inextricably linked to the Soviet government. It tried to control the society even on the level of musical preferences, and that's why a new fresh song was like a breath of an air for the people and a sentence for the system. The Soviet agenda at the time was like this. Rock music is a foreign, hostile, bourgeoisie culture, and that's why we need to fight it. The flood of the Western music into USSR was restricted even before rock music, in post-war years, when there were no recorders and cassettes. During those times, music enthusiasts obtained desired records with a great struggle. Besides the dangers that such an action could bring, the price of one album could be around 50 to 70 rubles, with the middle salary of a Soviet citizen around 100 rubles. Deals were often negotiated, the dealer and the buyer almost always knew each other in the face. The danger of unexpected raid was more than real. This is another Charlie Parker. Do you like Charlie Parker? I like. Oh, quite amazing. But look at this. No. Hey, hey, what's going on? Don't, don't touch me, I'm an American citizen. To be honest, the whole description of such an affair looks more like a drug sale. Well, maybe back then, the alien music from another world was indeed more like a drug. But since the 80s, the records have been sold almost openly, and the appearance of cassettes have made life much more easier. The Soviet militia that was tasked to confiscate the records wasn't really well versed into exactly what they were confiscating, and some of them were even listening to what they took from people. The funniest thing was that some of the Soviet officials and KGB employees themselves brought the forbidden records from that very rotting West. As the saying goes, if you can't win, lead. And that's how at the beginning of 60s appeared vocal and instrumental ensembles. Why such a clumsy name? Well, because it wasn't simply allowed to use the title rock at the time. As usual, you can't pass to red, you can't go to strikes, and you can't listen to rock. Fias will perform in patriotic songs like But adjusted for the times. Vias were ideologically verified correct bands, refined soldiers of music. Their appearance was also strictly dictated. Singing folk songs, here is your folk costume. A military patriotic song, here is your uniform soldier. No leather jackets and mohawks were even closely allowed. That wasn't also tolerated to jump and scream on the stage. One should perform quietly and calmly. Everything according to the order. And up to a certain point, such groups were even more popular than, for example, One Dawn nowadays. By this I mean that they were sold in some absolutely insane circulations and could give from three to four concerts a day for a week while collecting full halls. Most interesting thing is to absorb relations between independent rock groups and official vias. Here is what Markarevich said about this. In general, a bottomless abyss laid between the professional VS and independent groups. Even if professional bands tried to say something in their defense, there were no confrontation between both of them. 
Everyone understood that this is how the world works. To go, for example, to walk in the Merry Guys to Slobodkin, one of the Soviet labels at the time, was called to be sold into slavery. This, however, was compensated by a quiet life without attack from the police, good equipment and stable high earnings for the time. Then the guys did 3-4 concerts a day. It was clear that these harsh conditions were dictated by the life itself, and none of the underground singers spat on the back of the sold ones. In the 80s, independent rock performers began to come out of the shadows, and against their music, the positive and flat songs of VS began to look too dull. Most of the old VS fell apart, some of them went to the west, some tried to adjust to the time. And let's give the guys their due, many of them had some really great musical skill. <laughs> But, as it turned out, the only thing that really saved VS for a long time was the lack of competition. So, let us look at how independent rock groups were existing at the time. Смешно, что мы играли несколько лет тому назад, и ко мне подходит после концерта курсант и говорит, простите, вы гребенщиков, понимаете, говорит, такая петрушка. Я был на закрытом парт информации, я не знаю, как это называется. И там лектор рассказывал, что помимо внешних врагов, у Советского Союза есть враги внутренние, скрытые. За примерами далеко ходить не надо. Вот у вас в Ленинграде, говорит этот лектор. Есть такая группа «Аквариумы». Так вот, когда в Тбилиси был устроен музыкальный фестиваль, они вышли на сцену, голые, начали кричать антисоветские лозунги, разбрасывать листовки. И прямо на сцене, в довершение концерта, занялись гомосексуализмом. И курсант говорит, понимаете, как мне на это реагировать? Спросил он. Я говорю, ну вот вы умный человек, думайте сами. Soviet rock bands had a really hard time. Arranging a concert was not allowed. It was considered a private business that was forbidden in USSR. Концерт был подсудным делом. Собирать денег за концерт трижды подсудное дело. Возможность играть на людях музыку. Some of you might have heard about so-called apartment gatherings, some kind of underground music parties, but here we have also a catch. То есть тогда были квартирные концерты. Не было квартирных концертов, квартирные концерты были, понятие придумано потом. Квартирные концерты могли играть мы. Это мы начали это делать примерно в середине восьми, в начале восьмидесятых. Но ни одна группа с электрическими гитарами и с барабанами не может играть дома. Не может. Соседи сдадут их в менты в течение одной секунды. Well, this man, he was simply beyond all dimensions. He wasn't only rehearsing at home. He made a full-pledged studio there. But yet, this is a story for another time. In general, the repertoire did not allow everyone to play at home. And there were no recording studios except for the monopolist of Melody. The legendary Leningrad Rock Club became a real salvation for the rockers at the time. Such giants of Soviet rock as Grebenchikov, Tsoi, Kinchev and many others played there. To delve deep into the history of that establishment would take too much time. This place is simply filled with big stories and events. I will only add that the authorities did not want to add the word rock to the name of the place to the very last minute and characterized everything as some kind of music club. То есть рок-клуба не было юридически, был именно вот, клуб любителей музыки. Клуб любителей музыки, да. Мы всеми силами старались вести слово рок. В конце концов, это удалось, но не сразу. It means that you can't like nowadays rent a place where you can gather with your little band and play your music with no worries. And during those times it was impossible not to play your music. People didn't want an ideologically engaged music. They wanted something real. Ну а чему я могу научить сына? Мы живем с ним вместе, и он видит, какой я, какие мы все. Мы выросли в то время, когда кроме рок-н-ролла ничего не осталось, все остальное было обманом, все остальное было пустым. И вот та музыка, та жизнь, та любовь, в которой мы учились и учимся до сих пор, это самое главное, это поиск света и нахождение его. В том, как мы поем, в том, как мы живем, в том, как мы любим. Мы 
нашли этот цвет. The Soviet government did not negotiate with dissidents. For example, Yegor later was sent to an art house. He was stuffed with pills and drugs. Bastards tried to break his will. He was even taken by the classics of the time, the punitive psychiatry. All musicians of that time were in a constant state of anxiety. There was no internet to donate to your favorite singer, and it was necessary somehow to survive. They did it how they could. Sometimes there was even nothing to eat. To do such music was hard and dangerous, and it was obligatory to send your lyrics to Litovka. In the Soviet Union there was such body that was engaged in censorship called Glavlid. And before you get the right to perform your songs, you must send your texts to the censor in order to avoid any Soviet criticism, satire and any other forbidden themes. Nowadays it is pretty funny to read some of those old texts. From where else could a Soviet citizen knew about that Sex Pistols promoted violence, Kiss were now fascists, and all of those scorpions and black sabbats were all real maniacs and bastards? Our guys are also tight there. DDT, Kino, Aquarium, they are all too foreign, too capitalistic. Just look at them. They all think about how everything is cool and how everyone are happy. With you we will deal separately. Appeared a clear antagonism between the Soviet authorities and the freedom of an artist. Most likely, people who grew up in the USSR are very pleased to see how concerts all over the Russia are banned. It's great that they are banned from performing now. It's not even a real music. I don't really believe that one video can change people's mind, but at least it could sow a doubt. While googling the info for this video, I stumbled a few times on threads from Peekaboo, where people are 100% sure that under the repressions will go any singer except for their favorite. And they often forgetting that most of their favorite bands from the past were choked as hard as possible. The world became more civilized. Yes, for musicians of the past it was much tougher. But watching modern destructions for them, I can almost feel how much harder it is to breathe. Some of the big modern artists begin to censor themselves in order to avoid problems with government. An atmosphere of all-consuming paranoia and fear. Fear of saying something extra. That's all is coming back. History has long put everything in its place. The censors will be caused and forgotten when the system collapses, but the music will remain forever. The main thing is to struggle to speak freely, even to someone who isn't personally pleasant for you. So guys, thank you very much for your time. I hope it was interesting and enjoyable for you to learn something new about my homeland and in such troubled time I wish you to be healthy and simply be happy. We deserved happiness. We deserved Счастье и спокойствие.